Many of you are probably familiar with the classic American poem by Robert Frost, The Road Not Taken. Um, it's a pretty good chance that you had to read it at some point in your life or that you had to read it in school. And In fact, one of my daughters brought me her language arts book when I was working on this, and she's like, I've read that before. And she brought me her language arts book, and she had to read that poem uh, from her language arts book. And So there's a good chance you may be familiar with it. You probably have heard it, maybe you've read it for yourself, but you may not be familiar with the story behind it. You see, uh, when Robert Frost wrote that poem, he wasn't writing it for some deep inspirational thing. He actually wrote it as a joke because he was very good friends with another poet, a British poet um, named Edward Thomas. And um, him and Edward Thomas, they would uh, they enjoyed spending time together. They enjoyed walking through the woods, exactly what the poem talks about. And uh, But through their walks and, and, and their friendship, they realized, each, or uh, Robert Frost realized, that Thomas was very indecisive about most things. In fact, even on their walks through the woods, he literally would come to a fork in the road and he would just stand there. And, and he would kind of have this internal debate going on as to which way he should go because it was, it was his territory. Robert Frost was visiting him and so there was benefits to this one. There's benefits that way. And he said that he remembers, Robert Frost says, he remembers just standing there in the crossroads waiting for Thomas to pick one of these two roads they were going to go on. And then eventually Thomas would make up his mind and he would pick a path. And as soon as he picked a path, they would started walking down that path and almost immediately Thomas would start second-guessing himself and he'd start agonizing of, well, if I took the other road, I could have showed you this. If I took the other road, I, I could have uh, maybe shown you a, a different set of uh, scenes or something like that. And, and so Robert Frost wrote about uh, his friend Thomas, and he said that Thomas was a person who, whichever road he went, was always sorry that he didn't go on the other one, that he was always hard on himself that way. And so after spending a couple years with Thomas in England, uh, Frost came back, and he wrote this note, um, and he sent it to uh, Thomas as a joke because of all those times they stood between two roads, just trying to figure out which one to take. So he wrote it as a joke between him and a friend, and his friend said, this is really good. Like, you need to, and I'm sure he said it like with a British accent because he was from England, and I'm sure it sounded much, because he's a poet, he, he probably didn't say this is good. But he, he convinced him, like, you need to publish this. This is great. This is good stuff. And so Frost included in a book that he was already working on. He just stuck this poem in there, not knowing that in a couple years, this was going to be probably the defining poem of his life. I, my guess is that if you had to know a Robert Frost poem, this is probably the one you knew. And he wrote it in 1916, and, and it makes a huge difference. Um, and, and it's about this man who literally is standing at the forks of the road, and he's got to make a decision between these two paths. And so as we're in, uh, going through the book of Proverbs, when we are in chapter 4 today, um, we, we've gone backwards a little, about in, a little bit, and I've been holding on to this message because I've been so excited about it. So, sadly enough, I wanted to do it in person with you guys because I've just been so excited about it. Um, and so we get to this point in this section, in this chapter, in this book, where Solomon is presenting almost the exact same thing. That his son is standing at a crossroads. There are two paths, two options that he has to take. Two roads that are right in front of him. And his son has a choice that he has to make. And for us that are sitting here this morning, for us that are watching online, we, many of us may be standing at the same crossroads. That we have a choice to make. And standing in the crossroads is not an option. Going backwards is not an option. You have two choices. This one or this one. That's it. And so this morning, we're going to look at these two options. We're going to look at these two roads that Solomon presents to his son. And, and we're going to plead, kind of like Solomon does for his son, that he will take the road that is less traveled because it will make all the difference, not just now, but for all of eternity. So let's jump in Proverbs chapter 4. Um, I'm going to read, starting in verse 10, just for time's sake, 10 through 19. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 4, starting in verse 10, says, Listen, my son. Accept my words, and you will live many years. I am teaching you the way of wisdom. I am guiding you on straight paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Don't let go. Guard it, for it is your life. Don't set foot on the path of the wicked. Don't proceed in the way of the evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. If, for they cannot sleep unless they have done what is evil. They, have rob, they are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. 
They eat the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. In verse 18, the path of righteousness is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until midday. In verse 19, but the way of the wicked is like the darkest gloom and they don't know what makes them stumble. Let's pray together. God, I thank you so much. God, not only for this time to be together and not only to this time to worship you, God, but the reason that we are worshiping you. God, because you have made a way when there was no way for us. God, because right now you are doing something in the hearts of people sitting in this room and you are doing something in the hearts of people that are watching online. And God, even apart from us, you are doing something across and around this world. God, right now, God, you are saving people. You are healing people. God, you are making a path in a way that they didn't even know existed and was a possibility. It's made and it's there. And God, you are opening their eyes to it for the first time. And God, this morning, I am begging you to do that here. God, I am praying for anyone within the sound of my voice or, or watching online, God, who is standing at a crossroads trying to choose which path they want their life to go down. God, I'm praying this morning they realize that standing there is not the option. A different op path is not an option. God, that they have to choose between these two. And so, God, I'm praying... God, that you will use the words that you have in your text and the words that you have given me. God, to make it so clear. God, that they will make it so clear that they will know the path that you want them to walk. God, for every parent in this room, God, that they will know the path that you want them to lead and guide their kids down. And so, God, we are begging right now God, that you are doing what you called us to do. God, that you will do what you want to do and you will do what you have promised to do. And so, God, I pray for those that are standing at the crossroads. God, I'm praying for us who have already made the choice that we won't be content leaving somebody at a crossroads. But God, that right now, we will teach and we will guide them and we will lead them to a way that leads to you. And so God, I pray that you're working. And I pray, God, that you are speaking in a way that only you can. In a way that moves me. In a way that moves all of us out of the way. So that this path is so clear. God, and the options are so open to us. And so God, we give you this time to do what you will with our lives. Father, in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Many of you are probably familiar with the Disney movie, uh, Finding Dory. It's the sequel uh, to Finding Nemo. And I know that I've got kids and I'm all into the, the Disney movies. And, uh, and I was reminded of this movie um, for this text this morning. Um, and then so to, to help me prepare for this, I made my kids watch. Well, I didn't really make my kids watch it. I just turned it on and they just kind of joined me watching it. And so I'm not ashamed. I, I will stand in front of all of you and say, I still watch cartoons and I'm not ashamed of that, okay? Um, so if you've got a problem with that, that. We can talk about it later. But anyway, um, as I was watching that movie and, and kind of listening to it and, and preparing for this, there were two things that, that drew me into that movie. The first one was the number of times they used the word quarantine. All right? And I'll be honest with you, I've watched that movie a lot of times. And in fact, I watched it. And it came out four years ago. And quarantine was something that happened to animals. Quarantine was something that happened to fish when they got sick or they were... By the way, it's funny. Y'all, If y'all hadn't watched that, y'all need to watch it because the whole group has to go in quarantine because they're going to Cleveland. My kids watched that four years ago when we were coming to Cleveland. They're like, whoa, they're coming here. And we had to explain to them, no, this is, there, there's not an aquarium in Cleveland that they're going to. Um, but it was it, we watched this this week and I was like, wow, this whole movie is taking on this whole different meaning because we have been in quarantine. I know what these fish feel like now. I've been stuck in this little container and, and just wanting to be outside. And so this week that we watched this and I, was, I understood a whole lot more than I did four or five years ago that this isn't just fish. This is the mass population of people have now been in and out and in and out of quarantine so many times. But the other reason I was really drawn to this movie 
is because there's a beautiful scene in it uh, that, that popped in my mind as I was working through this text. And uh, for some of you that are familiar with the movie, you're going to know this scene. For some of you, let me lay it out for you. That Dory um, is a blue tang fish. She's one of those blue fish. She's blue and got yellow on her, and she's beautiful. And um, she is born with this short-term memory loss. She, she can't remember things for a very long period of time. She, she always has. She's been born this way. And so her parents, being great, loving parents, they're always trying to come up with ways that help her remember things. And so they'll, they'll come up with sayings, they'll come up with rhymes, they'll come up with songs like don't go near the undertow and stuff like that. And they'll come up with all these, these things that will help her remember things and help her remember kind of not just important, uh, not just stuff, but like things that will help her survive. Because one of their biggest fears is that she's going to get lost. One of their biggest fears is she's going to go out and play and, and not be able to find her way back home. And she's just going to kind of wander around in this aquarium that she lives in. And so her parents come up with this genius idea of how to fix this problem. This is their fear that she's going to get lost and not be able to find her way back home. So what they do is she loves seashells. That's fun to say that a couple of times. So she loves seashells, and they decide that they're going to make a path. They're going to make a way of seashells. Of seashells, And uh, yeah, we're going to get through that. And she, So they will lay a seashell down, and then because Dory likes them so much, she's like, oh, look, there's a seashell. And then she'll look up, oh, look, there's another seashell. Oh, look, there's an... And so she will follow these paths of seashells all the way till she gets back home. So her parents have literally prepared a path of seashells for her to follow from where she normally plays at until she gets back home. Her parents have laid this out for her so that anytime she gets lost, she just looks down and then she sees the seashells that she can follow to make her way back home. And so Dory does get separated from her family and she spends the, most of the movie trying to get back, trying to remember to how to get back to her parents. And if you've seen the movie, you know that you go through all these ups and downs and all these times and, and you get to this point in the movie where you're like, this is, it's done. Like even Dory has given up hope that she's not going to see her parents, she's not going to find them. Um, she gives up hope. And, and at this point in the movie, it's almost depressing. You're like, this is the worst Disney movie since Old Yeller. This is the worst Disney movie probably of all time. Like you've got me all excited. She's going to find her parents. And now we're at this point where even she's given up hope on finding her parents. And then she looks down. And when she looks down, she sees a seashell. And then she sees another seashell. And another seashell. And so she starts following these seashells. And she's an adult now. She's following these seashells. And she comes up on a, over this little hill. And she sees this little fish house. This little container that fish are living in. And it is surrounded with all these seashell paths that her parents have been making. And so she finds her parents. And her parents say, this is what we've been doing since we've lost you. This is what we've been doing since, since we couldn't find you. We have literally been spending our days and our years... Uh, years Years by now, we have literally been gathering seashells and making these paths so that wherever you came from, you would find the path that we wanted you on. You would find home and you would find us. You see, what Dory's parents understood is what all of us sitting in this room need to understand. The job of every parent is to prepare the path so that it is so clear that regardless of where your kid's at, they will know this is the path that leads home. And for Solomon, he does that in a very beautiful way in this passage. He, he tells us and he shows us this, that he is going to make a path so clear. This is his job as a parent. This is his job as a dad. This is a job for all of us sitting in this room. And, and Solomon's going to make it so clear that he's got tons of reasons for writing this book. But the main reason that he writes this book, and he sees it over and over again, the main reason he writes this book of wisdom is because he wants to make the path clear for his son to follow. This is the path that you need to be on. There's lots of other options, but this is the one that you need to follow. There's, there's lots of uh, the things that are out there, but you need to be on this path. And so again and again, as we've looked through these opening chapters of this book, he, he's appealing to his son. He's calling out to his son. He's pleading with his son. In fact, in the very first verse of this chapter, Solomon says in verse 1, he says, listen, my son, to a father's discipline and pay attention that you may gain understanding. And in the first verse that we read down in verse 10, he says, Listen, my son, 
Accept my words and you will live many years over and over and over again. If you, we've, This is the chapter 4, but we've already worked through chapter 8. You hear this same thing. You hear a dad pleading with his son, Son, listen, pay attention. I'm begging you to hold on to these words because there's such a passion of a dad who wants what is best for his son and he wants to make this path so clear for his son and he does it in, in the kind of this way that he, he shows him and he teaches him this is the path of righteousness. This is what it looks like to live a righteous life. And so when we look at verse 11 in our text, he says that in verse 11 that Solomon's preparing this way for his son in two ways. The first way he's doing it in the first part of verse 11, he says, I am teaching you the ways of wisdom. And that's the first way to prepare a path for us who are parents. It's the first way that he's preparing a path for his son is he is teaching him the ways of wisdom. Solomon has so much wisdom wisdom that he's preparing for his son that he's going to give his son and he's preparing his son to walk this path and he's got so much wisdom for not just his son but we get to inherit this wisdom as well as being sons of God's and daughters of God we get this benefit as well such practical knowledge such practical wisdom that if you will follow this advice if you'll hold on to these words then, then financially you'll be better off then, then you'll know how to, to avoid conflict you will be able to build and keep relationships you'll be a better neighbor you, you'll learn how to deal with foolish and arrogant people. You'll learn how to use words to avoid conflict instead of causing conflict. You'll, you'll have all this practical advice that Psalm is giving to his son. And honestly, advice that not just his son needs, but we need this advice as well. And so Psalm pleads over and over again, son, listen to these words. He's taking time to teach them. But there's something different that happens in this chapter than any other chapter in the whole book of Proverbs. Out of 31 chapters, there's something that happens here that really doesn't happen anywhere else. The advice that Solomon gives in the open section of this chapter is not just his. Right? I want you to look back with me. We didn't read this passage. Uh, we didn't read the whole thing, but the, the advice and the wisdom that he passes on here is actually generational wisdom that was passed down from his father, and now he's passing it on to his kid. I want you, if you've got your Bibles, back up with me to verse 3 for just a second. Verse 3, Solomon says, When I was a son, or when I was a son with my father... Tender and precious to my mother. So when I was young, son, when I was about your age, my dad sat down with me and we had a conversation. And he gave me words of wisdom that I've never forgotten. That I've never gotten over and I've always applied it to my life. That, that it was so important I've held on to it ever since then. In verse 4, he goes on to say, He taught me and he said, Your heart must hold on to my words and keep my commands and, you, and keep my commands and live. Do you see this pattern? Because this is so important. You see, David took time to sit down with his son and, and teach his son. And now you see that son sitting down with his son, teaching him the wisdom of his father. Teaching him the wisdom that's been passed down to him. What he got from his dad, he's now passing on to his kids. There's this beautiful pattern that David sets in the life of Solomon. Now Solomon is setting in the pattern in this life for his kids. I want you to understand this. I'm not talking about a man who just has a normal 8 to 5 job. I'm not talking about a guy that, that just gets, you know, he goes in at 8 o'clock and he punches out at 5 o'clock and that's his day. I'm talking about the king of Israel. If the king of Israel will sit down and take time to teach his son, don't you think we ought to do the same? You see, what we got to understand is that David doesn't defer this responsibility to anybody else. He could have. He could have said, listen, son, I've got so much to do right now. I've got wars that are going on. I've got battles to go fight. I've got all this stuff going on. I've got to manage this kingdom. I've got thousands of most millions of people all depending on me. And so, and, and so uh, you're, you've got this education. You've got other places you can get it from. In fact, go talk to somebody else. David doesn't defer this to anybody. In fact, he doesn't say, hey, um, let me hire you a special tutor. Let me get the royal court in here to teach you these things. In fact, he could have called in the high priest and said, hey, priest, we've got this great relationship. Why don't you take my son and you teach him what is spiritually right and you teach him what is spiritually true. He could have done that, but he doesn't. He doesn't defer to the priest. And let me tell you, in our modern time, he doesn't defer it to an Awana teacher or a gospel project teacher. He does it himself. And if the king of Israel can sit down with his son and give him words of wisdom and words to live by, then there's no reason why the rest of us shouldn't be doing it as well. 
You see, he sets a pattern for his son, and he sets this pattern for his son to live by that now he is passing on. He's not only preserving himself, he's not only preserving his next generation, but he's preserving his entire family line because the wisdom that he passes on to his son gets passed on to the next generation. And here we are thousands of years later reading this exact same wisdom. So let me first give you a word of encouragement for you guys that are parents. I'm betting that there were times when David was giving words of wisdom that Solomon rolled his eyes. I'm guessing there are times when David was giving words of wisdom and Solomon said, Dad, I know this stuff. I'm betting that he was just like every other teenage boy and every other teenage girl in no time that he's like, Dad, you don't know what you're talking about. Dad's dead and gone when Solomon writes this passage. But the words are there. And so let me encourage you as mom and dads, I don't know what the attitude you get from your kids. I don't know if they, they know it all by now or not. But the words that you say, they're there. And they sink into their heart. And they are there and they will pass those words on to their kids because it's not just the words, it is the, the reality that's there. So I'm going to share with you that, that over this past week, I have thanked God so many times that I had parents that took time to teach me and to set practical wisdom in my life, godly wisdom in my life. I had parents that set a pattern for my life and and set a pattern for me that I'm going to pass down to my kids. And and I realize that not everybody in this room and not everybody watching online, I realize that not everybody had that same situation. I realize that for some of you, your your parents were the last example for you. I realize that for some of you, your your parents were the the exact opposite of teaching you wisdom and godly wisdom. I get that. I understand that. And so I am so thankful that I had that experience. And, and I wish everybody had that same experience. But here's what I wanted to get to. It doesn't matter if you had that experience or not because you can be that experience. There's not a grandparent or a parent sitting in this room. There's not a grandparent or a parent that's watching online that you can't be the first of the generational wisdom, that you can't be the first one to sit down with your kids or maybe skip a generation, sit down with your grandkids and you say, this is the wisdom of truth. This is the word of righteousness. This is what God has told us. And this is the important stuff that you need to pattern your life on. There is nobody in this room regardless of what your parents did or didn't do for you that you can't do that for what's coming after you. Maybe it is you that's going to be that first generation that starts the generational wisdom for the rest of your life and the rest of your kids' life. It is our job as parents to prepare the path for our kids and to teach them what wisdom is and what God is and what godly wisdom looks like. And we can't defer that to anybody yet. It is our greatest responsibility to take the time. And if the King of Israel can do it, then why can't we? It will set our kids on a path that will set them for the rest of their life. You see, but there's more to it than just teaching them. Because if we're gonna if we're gonna teach it, we gotta be willing to live it as well. You see, there's one thing to, to talk a talk, but there's a whole different thing to walk the walk. That second thing that Solomon does in preparing the path for his kids is that he walks this walk. And we see it in verse eleven that we read the first part of it. He says, I am teaching you the way of wisdom. I am guiding you on straight paths. You see a different translation says that I've led you on the path of the upright. The Hebrew word there, it's a beautiful word. It could be to to lead, it could be to guide. But one of the big pictures that popped in my mind, and this is a good translation of the word, is that this is uh, someone who steps on something to bend it out of the way. And the reason that resonates with me so much is because I've told you guys before, I grew up doing a lot of hunting and coon hunting. And and so you guys that are hunters and maybe some ladies that are hunters, I don't want to discriminate either way. If you've been in the woods, you know that there are thickets in the woods. There are places in the woods where there's just so much brush and there's so much undergrowth and there's briars that just grow so thick that it's hard to get through those areas of the woods. Now, if you are hunting in the same area all the time, you know those are kind of there. Hey, there's a thicket over there, so let's go around it. But if you're hunting in an area you aren't familiar with, or maybe you're hunting in an area where your dogs are literally on the other side of that and you can't go around it, the only way to get to your dogs, or maybe sometimes to get back out, is to go through it. And so when I was a kid, we learned at a very young age that the best way to get through this as a kid was not try to blaze our own trail. Because we would get stuck in these thickets. We have literally been in thickets so hard that you get in there and you can't move. You see, what we found was the best way to get through a thicket was to get behind the biggest person. You see, the biggest person in those days was my dad. 
And my dad always took the lead. And my dad always stepped up front. And my dad literally stepped on briars. He stepped on branches and he stepped on sticks. And he stepped on, so then me being the smallest one, I was always in the back line. So by the time my dad went through and by the time my brother went through, I was walking pretty much on a paved highway. Like it was clear because they had stepped on, they had trodden down, they had treaded down all these briars. And I didn't have to deal with all the troubles that they had deal. They took care of all of them. And so this is the picture that Solomon's saying. This is what guiding and leading means for him. That he has stepped on and cleared out all the obstacles. He, he stepped on and got rid of all the briars and the thickets that are causing the problems. He has literally guided it there because what my dad did for me is what Solomon's saying he's doing for his son. Son, listen, the best way through this is that you just get behind me and you just follow in the footprints that I'm leaving you. All you got to do is walk where I've already been. Don't go that way. Don't go that way. Just get behind me and just stay behind me and just follow right in the footprints. Follow right in the footsteps that I'm laying down for you. And if you will follow these footprints, your life will be so much easier. See, that's what it is to guide and that's what it is to lead our kids. It is to clear a path before them, to leave footprints for them to follow so they know this is the path that I need to go on. You see, so many of us, and I'll, I'll throw myself in here, So many of us as parents, we are so guilty of trying to lead from behind. But you don't guide and you don't lead from behind. You have to do it from in front of them. Here's what I mean by that. So many of us want to guide and lead from behind. We want to nudge our kids in a certain direction. We want to push our kids into a certain direction. We want to shove them down this path. And instead of shoving them down a path, nudging them down a path, trying to, trying to, to get them to go on that path from behind, what Solomon says is, listen, you'd be much better off if you were on the path and you turned around and you said, hey, Come this way. I've already made this path for you. I've already cleared the path for you. Just walk where I've walked. I've already been here. You see, when you're shoving your kids out into a path, you don't know what's in that path. You don't know where that path leads. When you're nudging your kids, what they see is you're behind them. And guess what? The person behind is the person who's scared or they can't make the way. The person in front is the one that you're going to follow. And so what Solomon is telling and what I'm telling you is if we're going to be parents, we've got to be on the path. We've got to be walking the path. And we've got to be turning around saying, listen, son, follow me. I have made this path. I have been walking this path. I have walked this path so much, so long that I have worn it out for you. It is clear what you need to do. That you need to walk this path. And so instead of us nudging our kids to the Bible, we need to be in the Bible calling them to it. Instead of nudging our kids to come to church, we need to be the ones in church calling them to come with us. We need to be the ones walking the path calling them, come follow this path that I'm on. You see, we're not going to get our kids on the right path by nudging or pushing them from behind. We're only going to get them on the right path if we lead from in front. If we're the ones that are on the trail and we're calling out to them, come, this is the way. This is what you need to do. And so I want to ask you as parents and grandparents, is your walk and your talk matching each other? Because i got to tell you that if, if the path you're talking about is not the same path that you're walking on or living on, then your kids are never going to be on the path that you want them to be. You see, if we're going to talk about a path, we got to be on that path. If we're going to tell our kids that church is important, we better be in church ourselves. If we're going to tell our kids through Awana and through Gospel Project that this Word is truth and this Word brings life, then guess what? We better be in this Word ourselves. And I know I'm sitting here talking to a bunch of people that are in church. I'm sitting here talking to a bunch of people that are sitting at home and you're watching church together and I get that. But guess what? I don't see what goes on at your home. You know who does? Your kids do. Your kids learn really quick whether the talk that you talk is matching the walk that you're walking or not. Because if not, you're never going to have a kid who walks the path and the path that that you want to be on. There's a song that Casting Crowns wrote several years ago called The Slow Fade. And one of the lines of that song simply says this, Be careful, little feet, where you go, for it's the little feet behind you that are sure to follow. You see, your kids aren't going to hold on to the word you say. They're going to follow in the footsteps that you walked. And so if you want to prepare a path for your kids that will lead them to righteousness, if you want to prepare a path for your kids that will lead them into salvation, then you can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. And you've got to prepare them a path, not just by teaching them, but you've got to do it by leading them and guiding them, by being on that path in front of them and say, here it is, come follow this path. You see, our job as parents, the greatest responsibility we have 
is to prepare a path for our kids. And we're going to do it by the, life, the words that we say and the life that we live. Robert Frost's poem, The Road Not Taken, I read it several times this past week and several other people's opinion of it. And one of the articles that I found pretty interesting, and I never really thought about it until I read this article, is that this is probably the most misread and most misunderstood poem in American history. And it's especially true now because there are so many people that will use this poem and taglines of this poem because we live in this blaze your own trail mentality. We live in this time in this world that you just have so many options and you just you don't even have to choose an option. You just you just make your own option. You just make your own path. And so we live in this mentality, in this world that we live in, that there are thousands of paths. And in fact, if you don't like the thousands of paths out there, millions, billions of paths, make your own. That's the path that you should be on. And so there are folks that say the road that's less traveled is because nobody travels it, because it's your individual path. But do you realize that's not what the poem is about at all? Do you realize that when the, the, the man comes to the yellow woods, how many paths are there? There are two. There is not a third option. There is not an option of blazing your own trail. In fact, he never talks about blazing your own trail. He never talks about following your own light or following your own God. He never talks about anything. He's simply talking about these two roads that are in front of you, and you must choose between one of these two roads. That is the only option. It is this option or this option. And standing in the intersection is not an option. You have to choose one of these two. And you're one traveler. You cannot choose both of them. You have to pick one or the other. You can't walk down the middle and say, I'm on this one. You can't walk down the middle and say, this is the path I'm choosing. There is no third option. Robert Frost in the poem presents these two things that are right in front of you. And Solomon, in his words of wisdom to his son and to us, presents the same situation. You don't get multiple choices. You don't get multiple options. There are not seven billion roads for seven billion people. This is not a blaze your own trail or pick your own path. This is not make your own options. This is there are two. And so you need to look at these two paths and you need to figure out which of these two paths you want to choose because there's a path of righteousness and there's a path of the wicked. And there's these two options. That is it. There is nothing else. You know what there's not? There's not a path of good. There's not a path of, I'm better than them. There's not a path of, I'll be close. There's not an option for that. There is the path of righteousness and a path of of wickedness. That is all that there is. And so the choice is between those two. And so Solomon spends the next couple of verses giving us more of the characteristics and the destination of these two paths. And first he gives the characterization of the righteous path. At the end of verse 11 he calls it the straight path. And a different translation would say the path of uprightness or, or the upright path. And he, he says that this is the path he wants his son to take. This is the one he wants to lead him on and he wants to guide him down. And in verse 12 it says, When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, Run, you will not stumble. You see, this is a path that's well worn down. This is a path that has had folks following it and going down it for years. This is a path that is firm and is solid and established. This is a path you don't have to worry about things causing you trouble because people have already walked this path. People have already gotten rid of the rocks and the stuff that's in your way. And so you've got room. You've, you've got the, the opportunity to run as fast as you want to down this path because this path is safe. This path is secure. There's stability and there's security on this path that's not anywhere else. But I want you to understand that he doesn't say that this path means that all your troubles fade away. Because in the very next verse, in verse 13, he goes on to say this about the path. He says to hold on to instructions. Don't let go. Guard it, for it is your life. You see, this path is well worn. This path is well established. It is firm. It is solid. But this path requires work. This path requires consistent work on your behalf. Because if you're going to hold on to something, it doesn't mean that you just put it in your arms and you just hold it there. It means that you're grasping it. You're holding on to it. And the other word is guarding it. You don't guard something by just putting it off to the side and then coming back five or six years later. That's not what you do. You see, if you're going to choose this path, it means you pick it up and you walk it consistently. You're going to be on this path. You hold on to what this path is doing and you hold on to the ride that this path is. It takes work. It takes energy to be on this path. It may be safe and it may be secure, but it doesn't mean that all your troubles are going to fade away. It doesn't mean that all the temptations are not going to be there. It doesn't mean that life is suddenly going to come easy street for you. It means that you're going to have to work. 
You're going to have to hold on, and you're going to have to do it consistently and constantly. That's what he tells you about this path, and he's very open, he's very honest with you, and I'm going to be just as honest. If you choose the path of righteousness, it doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. It doesn't mean that everything's going to be smooth and everything's going to be simple. There's going to be no bumps in the road. It means you better hold on. You better set firm, and you better guard these words of wisdom because you're going to need them down this path. There's times that this path is safe and secure, and there's times this path is safe and secure, but it's rough and it's bumpy. And so you've got to be consistently and constantly holding on to these instructions and putting them into practice in your life. This is how you guard your heart, which is what he talks about later in verse 23 in this passage. This path is smooth, it's stable, it's secure, but it's not easy. You don't pick this path because it's the path of least resistance. You don't pick this path because it's going to be the easy road. You pick this path because it's safe and secure. And really, you're going to pick this path because of where it leads. And we're going to get to that in just a minute, you see. But the other path is the path of the wicked. In the next few verses, uh, this is what Solomon talks about, the characteristics of this. And, and, and it, this is the picture, you looking down this road. And when you look down this road to see if this is the road you want to get, if this is the road you want to get, these are the things you're going to see. And this road is enticing. This road is, is, is wanting you to travel it. And it's so enticing that, in fact, it's so enticing that in verse 15, he has to warn his son four different times about the danger it holds. In verse 15, he says, avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it. Pass it by. Don't even look at it. Don't even consider it. Go in a different direction. Don't even think about it. And one reason that it's so enticing, this road is, is because of what it looks like it offers. You notice in verse 17, they're eating the bread of wickedness. They're drinking the wine of violence. There's, there's pleasure down this road. There's, there's satisfaction right in front of your face that's on this road. You see, you don't get that when you hear the other road. Those things aren't presented to you right on the front. They're not in the beginning. They're not the start of the path. They're the end. We'll get to that in a second. But they're not in the front. You see, what you see down this road, you see a bunch of people that have everything they need, everything they want. You see them living in pleasure and living for satisfaction that is right there and right now in this moment. You don't have to wait for it. Part of the allure of this road is that you don't have to have the troubles. You just get all the rewards. That's the allure of the road. But see, the other allure, the other thing that makes this road so enticing is that it is a popular path to be on. It is the popular place to be. In fact, if you notice that every time he talks about this road, he talks about the road being singular, but the people that are on it, they are multiple. They are plural. I want you to see this in verse four, in several ways. In verse 14, it says, Don't proceed in the way of the evil ones. Way being one, but the evil ones being a lot of them. Verse 16, they can't sleep. They are robbed. Verse 17, they eat the bread of wickedness. Every single time he talks about this, this road, there's a group of people on this road. There, there's a whole set of people on this road. And so it really echoes what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, when he talks about the gates of heaven. And he says in verse 13, he says, Enter through the narrow gates, for the gate is wide and the road is broad, which leads to destruction. And get this, and there are many who go through it. In verse 14, How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few Find it. It's the same road that Solomon is talking about here. It's the same road that Solomon is warning his son about. The warning is clear. Just because something is popular and just because there's a lot of people on that road doesn't make it the right road. Just because there's a lot of people choosing that doesn't make it righteous and it doesn't even make it right and doesn't make it healthy for you. Just because a lot of people are picking that doesn't mean that's the right choice. You see, the last characteristic of this road is that even if it looks promising... It is actually a deception because it's addictive and it never fulfills what it's given you. It never fulfills the promise that it says. In verse 16, he's talking about the people who have chosen this road. In verse 16, it says, But they can't sleep unless they have done what is evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. You see, they've got the bread of the wickedness. They've got the wine of violence. And, and they've got those things. And those things are what enticed you to be on. There, there's all this satisfaction. But you notice they're the ones being robbed. They're the ones losing sleep at night. They're the ones who can't sleep unless they're doing more. And they're doing more wickedness. And so what they started with this, I'll just take this little drink. I'll take this little sip. All of a sudden they're losing sleep and they can't get enough of it. They're losing sleep. And so the promise was you'll be satisfied. You'll have everything you want. Everything you need is right here on this road. And then what does it do? It just leads you to you don't get it. 
You don't get the satisfaction. You don't get the gratification that you thought you were going to get. You're going to lose sleep at night plotting revenge. You're going to lose sleep at night trying to get even. You're going to lose sleep at night trying to figure out how to act more evil than you are right now. You're going to lose sleep at night trying to catch up on the latest gossip on Facebook or Instagram. Or Facebook or Instagram. You're going to lose sleep at night trying to, to, to satisfy your deception and satisfy your, your, your uh, perversions that are going on. You're going to be finding out that you are more incomplete then than you ever were beforehand. But by the time you do it, you're already on the road. See, that's not what we see at the beginning of the road. What we see is satisfaction. But Solomon's given this warning that you need to pay attention not to the beginning of the road, but you need to pay attention to what's at the end of the road. See, this is the greatest lesson of the book of Proverbs that emphasizes over and over again. It's not just to look right in front of you. Look beyond that. Look at where this is leading you down. Right? Warren Wearsby says this. He says, The wise man always checks the destination before he buys the ticket. And this is what Solomon is making clear. These two paths lead to a destination. And you don't need to be concerned as much about the, the path as where these two destinations are. You don't need to be concerned as much about where, what the road looks like as much as where these two roads are leading. So in verse 18 and 19, he tells us the destination of the end of each of these paths. And this is before you make these choices, you need to see where you're going to end up. In verse 18, he tells us the end of the path of righteousness. In 19, he tells us the end of the path of wickedness. But in verse 18, he says, The path of righteousness is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until midday. This short path of righteousness. It gets better and clearer with each step that we take. And the reason it does so is because we can, we can see there's light at the end of the sun. The reason this light or this path gets brighter and brighter every day is because of what's at the end of this path. And what's at the end of this path is what Jesus says in, verse, in John chapter 18 verse 12. And Jesus says, and he's speaking to them, he says, I am the light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You see, the reason that this path gets brighter and brighter and brighter is because the more we walk this path, the closer we get to the light. The closer we get to the light is the closer we get to Jesus, who is the light. You see, the reason this path gets brighter and brighter and brighter until the brightest point of the midday is because at the end of it is Jesus. And the end of it is the one who gives us life. And so at the end of it is a way that there is no darkness anymore. We will never stumble in darkness. We'll never try to figure out another path because at the end of this path is the satisfaction we've been looking for. At the end of this path is the one who loved us enough to give us this path. At the end of this path is the one who came to the world that is full of darkness to shine a light so bright that we can walk in this light and we can be in this light and He's going to give us life everlasting. That's what's at the end of the, right, of the path of righteousness. That's the path that many of you are going to want to choose. But then let's look at the end of the other path. You see, at the end of the other path in verse 19, but the way of the wicked is the darkest gloom. They don't know what makes them stumble. You see, darkness and the darkest gloom is the absence of the light. You've got two paths in front of you. You've got a path that's going to lead you into light and get brighter and brighter every single step you take. And then you've got a path that's going to lead you completely away from that light. In John 3, verses 19 and 20, it says, Then this is the judgment, that light came into the world, and people love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. Verse 20. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that their deeds may not be exposed. You see, this morning there's a chance that you have to choose. This morning you are standing at a crossroads and you have an option to choose a path that's going to lead to light and a path that's going to lead to eternal life or you have the one that's going to lead you away from God. And you're going, to do, you're going to make that choice because you either love God or you love darkness. That's the only two options. You see two roads diverge in a yellow wood. And being but one traveler, I could not travel both. I looked down one and I saw pleasure in lots of people in the undergrowth. But that path led to darkness and death was its end. And then took the other as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim. And though it was steady and quiet, and many called it lame, but it led to Jesus and life to spare. Two roads diverged in the woods, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and it has made all the difference. This morning there are some of you who are standing at a crossroads in your life, 
And the crossroads is simply this. Are you going to choose the path that leads to righteousness and the path that leads to eternal life? Or are you going to choose a path that leads to darkness and a path that's going to lead to gloom and away from God? Or are you going to choose a path that gets brighter and brighter every single day and every step you take? Or are you going to, lead, or are you going to follow a path that leads to despair and darkness that just gets darker and darker and darker until you don't even know which direction you're facing anymore? The two paths are all that there are. The two paths are all the choices that there are. Which one are you going to choose this morning? Let's pray together.